on Zoom and everybody who's here with us in Arlington 213 this afternoon to join us for our March Cats Colloquium, our first spring installment for spring 22. And we're so excited to have Associate Professor Summer Bingham Music and her uh, very important doctoral dissertation research she's going to share with us. We're really excited to, to hear about it and to learn more from her. So with that, Summer, I appreciate you. <laughs> And I am going to turn it over to you and just. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Ella, Dr. Smith, just for asking me to do this. Um, Rob can attest to the fact that for two weeks I've been trying to figure out how to condense an entire dissertation into a one hour presentation. And um, it's been a struggle. <laughs> um, but we're there. So. Um, the title of my presentation is Knowing God in the Aftermath of Child Sexual Abuse, Reimagining the Triduum. And I know that has some inner, that's some insider language. So Triduum just means Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. Okay, so reimagining Jesus' passion narrative through, through Easter weekend. Okay. Um, before we get started, I want to give you a content warning. Okay. Um, my work is heavy. Okay. Um, there is some graphic language in my work, and I just want to prepare you for that as we get started. Um, because, you know, if we're going to be talking about this, then we need to talk about it, not from just an overly intellectualized, heady perspective, but to know that this is a real experience that real people encounter. Okay? And with that in mind, um, know that sometimes this material can be difficult to sit with and difficult to hear. Um, you know your body better than anyone else in this room. So if you have feelings of anxiety or, or intrusive thoughts, you need to get up and stretch your legs, go to the bathroom, your foot falls asleep, or if you're having difficulty with some of this material, please feel free to take a pause, a breath, take a walk if you need it. And I'm going to ask our colleagues in the room to not ask any follow-up questions unless invited to do so. That way people don't feel like Oh, if I get up, everybody's going to know something about me. Right? Um, so know that uh, in our life journey, everybody is healing from something. Okay? Um, and I am very grateful that you are joining in this conversation with me um, so that we can hopefully create space for more healing. Um, there's healing in dialogue and healing in community. So thank you so much for being here and being part of this. Okay? If you are part of the UPOC campus community and you need some outside resources to help after this, if something shakes you a little bit and you need to talk to somebody, our campus resources are here on the screen, the Office of Spiritual Life and our Thrive Counseling uh, Office, their contact information is here. If you are not part of the UPOC community and you're joining us online, I'm going to direct you to RAIN. Okay? Um, they have a hotline and a phone number that can help connect you with local resources. Okay. So, with that being said, let's jump right in. So, a quick summary of this work. Okay. Um, this work examines child sexual abuse in the form of incest through a theological lens. We're going to discuss the spiritual impact of this violence and bring it into dialogue with Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. Okay. So, Jesus' narrative is going to be reimagined through this lens. Of child sexual abuse. Okay. So some common terms that you'll hear me use throughout. Okay. Um, CSAI, child sexual abuse in the form of incest, you might hear me call it child sexual abuse, incest, CSAI, know that anytime I use any of those terms, that's what I'm referring to, okay, and I'll use them interchangeably. Okay. You'll hear me say the word God image a lot. Okay. Uh, when I say God image, I'm not referring to a dictionary definition of what we think of when we think of God. I'm referring more to a personal, um, internalized, deep understanding of the type of person we imagine God to be. Okay, so not you know a dictionary definition, but who we think God is. And whether or not we're religious, we all have some idea of who God is. So that's that's what I'm referring to is that deeper understanding of God image. Okay. And also, I'll be using the words victim and survivor interchangeably throughout. Okay. So when we open up the Bible, one of the first things that we learn is that humanity is made in God's image. Genesis says 
Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created humankind in God's own image, male and female, God created them. What does that mean? Like, what do you think that means? You've, we've heard that so often that we're made in God's image, but let's talk for a minute. What do you think that means? And people online, feel free to jump in too. Yeah. Our bodies are sacred. Okay. So you have an embodied understanding of what it means to be made in God's image. What else? Okay. I'm just going to repeat what you say so they can hear you online. Okay. So Rob said the capacity for love and free choice. What else? What else do you think that means? Okay. okay. So we matter. Uh, everyone has inherent value and we matter. Uh, well, it turns out in theology, we've argued about what this means for a really, really long time. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are several models that kind of encapsulate some of the things that you just said, our body, relationship, our inherent worth. Okay? Um, so I've organized them into four or five major categories, and I'll just hit the highlights with you. Okay? Um, the substantive understanding, that's people like Augustine, who thought that to be made in God's image, the Imago Dei, was something that we possess like our rationality that sets us apart from the rest of creation that human beings can reason at a level beyond the rest of creation augustine is famous for saying it's our ability to remember know and love god okay so that capacity for relationship um, others like martin luther understood it from an eschatological perspective in other words it's something that we grow towards that will that will be realized fully when we come into god's kingdom okay um, other people look at it and say, oh, it's, it's our function, our morals, our behaviors, the way that we engage, engage people. It's our capacity for relationship with God and others. And so I argue, I'm with you, Jennifer, right, for an embodied understanding of the Imago Dei, because it's through our bodies that we experience the world. It's our bodies that hold this capacity for reason. It's our bodies that we engage in moral behavior and relationship and growth. It's in our bodies that we experience a sense of worth. Right? So our body is sort of the first, the first point of contact with the world in our understanding. Okay? So Irenaeus argued that Jesus was the ideal manifestation of the Imago Dei. Right? And that's through our bodies that we experience the world. And Jesus had a human body. Okay? And so through his life, we can see kind of this idealized way of knowing God, of loving God, of building relationship, um, of our capacity for, for higher moral reasoning. Okay? So if this is our starting point, human beings are made in God's image, and it's through the body that we experience that truth. How does that actually work? Right? So that's kind of the next step. And that brings us to embodied theology. Okay? Embodied theology is not theology about the body. I'm not talking about the body like it's an object. It's theology through the body. So how can the body teach us about God? How does the body teach us about ourself? And how does the body teach us about that relationship between God and self? Okay. So the body is revelatory of God, and there is a significant amount of literature uh, about this idea, but I'm going to boil it down into two major points. The first is that our bodies are marked with social location, and the second is that our movement over time shapes our theological knowing. Okay. You following me so far? Yeah. Okay, so M. Sean Copeland, uh, she's a womanist the theologian. She argues that bodies are marked with social location, race, gender, sexuality, and as a black theologian, she's interested particularly in issues of race. So one example is the social location that we assign to bodies can oppress and subjugate people. For example, the way society thinks about black bodies leads to oppression. 
right? The way society places expectations on a female bodies can lead to subjugation and oppression, okay? Um, so this thinking deeply about the way bodies are marked and the way that we treat bodies in society can help us think more deeply about ethics. Jesus, for example, frequently engages bodies. Okay? Um, he touches lepers. He heals people like the hemorrhaging woman that are deemed unclean. And if the goal in Christianity is to be more Christ-like, then Jesus operates as a model that helps us challenge the way we treat bodies in society. So it helps us deepen our ethics and make them more Christ-like. So in my dissertation, one of the things that I'm looking at is how the sexually abused body is marked by a particular social location. We're marked by society. Okay? What stereotypes and narratives does society place upon the sexually abused body? Okay. So the social location helps us reveal God because it pushes us to transform the way we engage diverse bodies. Okay. The second major point is made by Bonnie Miller McLemore, who talks about how we move over time shapes the way we know. Okay. So, for example, if you process forward to church to receive the Eucharist from a priest, what does that teach us about God versus if we're sitting in a pew and we take communion and we pass it and serve our neighbor? Okay. Another way to think about this is the way we pray. So I'm going to have everybody stand up for a minute. All right, so if we're going to pray and we bow our head and clasp our hands in front of us and kind of roll our shoulders in, okay, and you imagine praying like this, that communicates something about the way your body is held. Now, if you stand and you pull your shoulders back and you lift your face up and you hold your arms out and you pray like this, you have a very different feeling in your body, right? So how does the way we practice theology over time, the way we live in life, the way we hold our bodies over time, how does that shape what we know about God and about ourselves? Okay, take a sit back now. So in the case of child sexual abuse, okay, when it's experienced particularly repeated instances over time, as it typically is, how does that shape the way we encounter God? If the body is continually oppressed, if the body is continually violated, what does that teach us about God? What does that teach us about the self? Okay. What does that teach us about the self in relation to God in moments of oppression? Okay. So we often talk about the Imago Dei and we talk in theology a lot about how skin creates distance between us and God. You've heard that, right? One of the things we don't really talk about with the Imago Dei is what happens if we're sinned against. Okay. We're really big on the whole, yes, if you sin and you live an immoral life, it'll create distance between you and God, right? And you need to turn back to God and all these things. But we don't really talk about what happens if you're sinned against. What does that do to the concept of the Imago Dei within you? Okay. And that's the space that I want to go to. Okay. So I want to shift gears for a second. Actually, let me go back so it doesn't distract you until I get there. So I want to shift gears. Okay? Um, and, you know, to summarize really quick, humanity is made in God's image. It's to the point that we experience that truth. And we need to stop and think about what happens if we're sinned against. So making a more intentional shift to thinking about child sexual abuse, I want to read a poem to you. It's a poem written by a survivor of child sexual abuse, uh, submitted anonymously. And it has some tough language in it, okay? It has some pretty graphic language in it. Um, but it's important to go to this space to honor the story and narrative, to understand the depth of what has happened in such an experience. I was nine when I learned about my body from rape. I had been sleeping, and when I woke, his hands were fumbling where they shouldn't. You'll be beautiful one day. God, please, what's happening? The first night it happened, I felt a night unaware until the body had space for someone else. Please make the stop. I could smell of his bed, of his semen as it spilled into me while he 
Make sure you get it all. God, please don't let me be pregnant. He touched himself quickly. I made on my own ear as a tear slid unnoticed down my cheek. It's clear it's me to this day. And even what you just God, please don't let anyone manage to get myself clean or find my voice to protest. I clutch and I pray being dying to make the burning stop. God, please don't let this happen. God, please don't let me be pregnant. God, please don't. God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please, until that God was dead. Every nine minutes, substantiate claim of sexual abuse. 57% of all victims reported to law enforcement agency or juvenile. One in every seven victims of sexual violence is under the age of six. And one third of sexual assaults involve a child under the age of 12. Reports of child sexual abuse suggest 25 to 35% of women are sexually abused as children. Children are most vulnerable between the ages of seven and 13, and most girls are abused between the ages of 12 and 14. Girls are six times more likely than boys to become victims, and 86% of women that suffered sexual abuse by a family member experienced other instances of sexual assault after the age of 90 all offenders are, and 92% of all juvenile victims are abused by a family member or close acquaintance. Arrests are made in only 27% of cases. Only 3% of offenders are strangers to the victim. And the Department of Justice determines that nearly 77% of all sexual assaults involving a child occur within the home of the victim or the perpetrator. The younger the child is, the more likely it is that the perp is a family member. 25 to 35% of women are sexually abused as children. Let's let that sink in for a minute. That's one in four, roughly. Okay? One in four women in our grocery store checkout lines one in four women in our college classrooms, okay? one in four women in our church pews. And we don't talk about it because it's so taboo. We're doing better. But the reality of this statistic needs to hit home. The reality of the depth of this wound needs to be brought to light. Tech interruption, sorry. Summer. Yes. The, sometimes, maybe it's my internet, but it, it sounds like we're I'm losing your, your sound a bit. Is that what you guys are working on? Yeah, we're working okay. on it. And it might be easier if I just stand near the computer and take my mic off completely. Yeah, let's try that. The box was in my pocket. That Can you hear us now? Computer. Yes. Is it, okay. Is it a clearer? It, it's it. Well, you know, with that other mic, it's really nice and clear, but until it doesn't work, <laughs> but it's fine. I would say do that. I think it'll work. Okay, so I'll stand right here. Is that better? That's good. Okay. So. When we think about those statistics and we bring that reality home, we have to really stop and sit with the totality of what has happened. Okay? 
So Shelly Rambo, she states that for those that survive trauma, it's like an ongoing death. That death has not ended. So how can we endure after a death like that? How do we keep going when the experience is so far reaching? Okay. Typically when a child is abused, Typically, when a child is abused, it happens in a series of repeated traumas over time. It's not typically a one-off, okay? And this can lead to the development of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's a little different than post-traumatic stress. I mean, it's characterized by hyperarousal, hypervigilance, avoidance, nightmares, and flashbacks. But it also brings with it a, a degraded sense of self, a sense of worthlessness and shame and guilt, um, relationship problems, intimacy problems, difficulties with emotional regulation, a lot of anger. Okay? Um, it fundamentally harms the core of who one is. And it rarely happens in a vacuum. Okay? Uh, more often than not, um, there are other instances of abuse, neglect, and dysfunction in the home, which can make that adverse childhood experience score increase. And the higher the ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Experience score, the greater the risk of long-term health complications. So we know that incest can impact someone biologically, socially, and psychologically throughout their life. But what's the spiritual impact of all this? What is the spiritual impact uh, of child sexual abuse. Who is the God of the incest survivor and what does it mean for an incest survivor to be made in God's image? Jane Grovajohn says that for a young girl victimized by another's brutalizing touch, more than just her flesh is violated. Her very self, the root of whatever we like to think makes us persons is attacked and violated. And somewhere in that place or location of rape subjectivity, God is very much at risk. And it begs the question, how is our God image formed? Who taught us about God? And how is that shaped over our life? Uh, Freud is famous for saying that our God image is informed by the relationship we have with our parents, and particularly our father. He had all these theories, but he never carried them through on a clinical level. His work was picked up by a woman named Anna Maria Rizzuto in her book, Birth of the Living God. And she presents several case studies that apply Freud's theories on a clinical level. And some of the stuff she found agreed and some of it disagreed. But the gist of it is our God image is formed through a complex series of internalized relationships as they encounter the external world. Okay? It's a projection of our internalized relationships, not merely, I think dad is scary, so God is scary. That's too simplistic but the dynamic of that relationship that gets internalized and projected, the sense of worth that's built in that relationship that gets projected in some ways. And so we mirror others through life and society teaches us that God is this idealized version. So you have all of this complexity wrapped up into our God image. So Rizzuto found that um, our God image forms first and foremost in infancy when a baby establishes safety and trust with a mother. And as we grow and make sense of life, we work and rework our memories, embellishing them with our childhood fantasies and imaginations. And we encounter God socially and, and prearranged spaces like the church. Um, and God is found on that boundary between the internal and external world. Okay? So a God image inventory was created to kind of measure some of and I ask questions, um, is God there for me? Is my parent there for me? Does God want me to grow? Do my parents want me to grow? Am I good enough for God to love? Am I good enough for my parents to love? Is God the sort of person who would want to love me? Are my parents the sort of people who would want to love me? And as all of this is unfolding, we're also maturing in our faith throughout our lifetime. Uh, so Fowler comes up with six stages of faith development. The first is the primal or undifferentiated phase. That's the space when you have a baby, you hold the baby, and the child looks up at the mother, 
you know, that eye contact, mom's in the room, right, when a baby's nursing, they have this sense of belonging, they exist, right, they're safe, um, and that sort of forms the foundation right, of, of how we think about the world. The intuitive projective phase is the preschool stage, roughly, where we need concrete symbols and stories. We start to get very basic, simple stories to help us make sense of the order of the world. The mythic literal stage is the school age stage where we have strong beliefs of justice. God will literally intervene to end injustice. God will literally punish the bad and reward the good. There's not a lot of self-reflection in this stage, but there's this heightened sense of, of good and evil right, in our stories and in our religion. And in the synthetic conventional stage, that's the space where we start to reflect on our own identity. Right? Um, when we start to get a sense of who we are. Our sense of self is shaped by how we think other people see us, including God. And Fowler sums it up really well in this couplet. I see you seeing me. I see the me I think you see. I'm going to read that again to you. I see you seeing me. I see the me I think you see. Most CSAI occurs between this mythic literal and synthetic conventional stage of faith. That's when we anticipate that God will literally intervene when bad things happen. That's when our identity is being formed. So what happens when this horrific abuse oppresses someone day after day? What happens when somebody's sexually violated, when they lose all sense of safety, have nowhere to turn, and even God does not stop the abuse? What happens to our sense of self? What happens to the Imago Dei? The child can learn that they're not a person before God. And a deicide occurs. Deicide is a death of the way we know God. And this is not just a psychological distortion. It's a profound death of hope and faith. The God that the child has been taught about socially is shattered. God doesn't intervene. God doesn't exact justice. God doesn't provide safety. So the first half of my dissertation is outlining all this in detail. The context, okay, um, the, the, the systems that allow this type of abuse to take place, how God images form, what the Imago Dei is, what embodied theology is, and how we know God through the body. So if we could summarize that first half, it's humanity is made in God's image, and the body reveals God. Okay. CSAI has long-term impacts and shapes the way we understand ourselves. Okay. Our God image is formed through complex internalized relationships and our faith matures over time. CSAI typically occurs in the stages when we expect a strong justice-oriented God and a sense of ourselves to be formed. Okay. So CSAI, therefore, results in a deicide or a death of the traditional ways of knowing God. Follow me? Okay. So now I want to make another shift okay, to the second half of my dissertation, which arguably is still being written. So <laughs> hopefully we can get some good feedback and you can help me develop these last couple of chapters. Okay? So in the second half, I take all of this theory, all of this foundational work, and start to look at how we tell the story. CSAI tells a narrative of shame and isolation. It tells a story of, of degradation and dehumanization. Okay? It tells us that we are less than, that we are not people before God. Okay? And so what happens if we try to flip that narrative? David Tracy argues that Christ is the prime analog. What that means is that Christ's story is sort of the prime analogy, the ideal analogy to compare all other experiences to. That when we do that, we can get to a deeper sense of, of understanding uh, of theological knowing. Okay. So Tracy said that the stories people tell disclose their character, but the story that we are discloses a human possibility that can sometimes go in there. And so that's what I want to do in this is look at who we are at the deepest core as images of God. And how does that change the way uh, we think about this narrative? So <clears throat> these stories are important. They shape our world. 
And by bringing it into dialogue with Jesus' experience, we can flip that narrative. So this road to deicide is paved with peripheral deaths along the way, even for Jesus. He encounters a death of safety, innocence, and the body. Through Jesus' life and ministry, he carefully crafts a sense of safety for other people through acts of love and relationship. He leads with truth by including social outcasts. He heals people that have been deemed impure. He teaches that love is the culmination of sacred law. Like the pure and innocent child, Jesus' life is an example of God's kingdom made known on earth. It's remarkable then that a herald of safety experienced such a profound loss of security in his last days. And this death of safety was brought about by those closest to him, his disciples. Now, everyone in the room might not be religious, but I'm going to trust that you know the basic narrative here. Okay. Um, Jesus is betrayed by his disciple Judas. Okay. Judas agrees to hand his teacher over to the authorities for a bag of silver. And prior to handing Jesus over, he joins the Last Supper with him and his disciples. And Jesus knows that Judas has betrayed him. And we often hear how remarkable it is that Jesus dined with Judas. We hear a lot of Judas 8 too, as a reminder to love our enemies, that Jesus didn't turn his back on someone that betrayed him, and as Christians, neither should we. And while this profound love and acceptance is remarkable, the experience of incest pushes us to pay attention in a different way. What was it like for Jesus to dine with Judas? The text tells us that he's troubled that his friend, uh, the one that has left everything and made it his primary calling in life to follow Jesus, will betray him. What did the knowledge of that betrayal feel like in his body? Did Jesus feel the weight of that betrayal on his chest? Did the burden of disloyalty constrict his breath? Did his stomach churn as he chewed his meal? Did his skin prickle with dread as Judas left the room and headed into the darkness? Did his hands shake as he told those remaining about his body and blood that would soon be broken? For children that have experienced CSAI, dining with Judas is an ever-present reality. Day after day, they share space with those that have professed to love them and yet actively harm them. In addition to the bodily harm that they experience by their perpetrator, the death of safety is made more profound by the non-offending caregiver. Judas doesn't crucify Jesus, but he sells him out. Dan Allender notes that that complicity can look like direct solicitation, where a parent actively places a child in harm's way. An example of this might be um, a father talking to his teenage son about sexuality in an inappropriate way. Uh, engaging in locker room talk or indicating that in order to be a man, you have to be sexually promiscuous. You might encourage his son to sexually abuse his sister or other girls. Another example Allender uses is um, a mother tells her daughter to go play baseball, with father, uncles, and cousins. Not wanting to hear her mother nag, the 14-year-old girl goes to play. And a short time later, the mom tells her to take her shirt off so that it won't get dirty. And she keeps hounding her until she does. It comes as no surprise then that the 14-year-old girl didn't get sexually abused by her father and her cousin after the game. In this case, it's clear that the mother sets her daughter up and gives permission for her to be abused. In a situation like this, how is this 14-year-old supposed to behave? She's been sexually violated by her father and cousin. Her mother creates a space for it to happen. Her home, her body, her family are riddled with fear. She's not safe. Her parents, whose calling it is in life to love and protect her, are the very people that bring about her harm. And in situations like this, the child must die, live, and build relationships with Judas while being betrayed daily. How does that live in the body? Beneath the mundane interactions and ordinary life events, they have to grapple with this confusing and painful reality of love and betrayal. As conversations about school and homework and bills cloud the kitchen table, the child dips their bread with Judas, silently suppressing this ongoing betrayal. Does her breath constrict and her heart ache? Does her rage boil and threaten to burst from her chest? Does her voice catch in her throat? Do her eyes silently beg her non-offending parent to notice? This betrayal is one blow in the deicide that occurs. 
Jesus' safety takes another hit prior to his arrest at the Garden of Gethsemane. In this text, Jesus retreats a short distance from his disciples and asks them to stay awake. And his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. It's not difficult to picture. He kneels and prays and his sweat falls like drops of blood. His soul overwhelmed with sorrow. He speaks desperately to God as he awaits his fate. This narrative floods our senses with foreboding. What does he feel here? Does he notice the ground pressing into his knees as he asks God to take this cup from him? Does he blink burning sweat from his eyes? Does he wipe it from his upper lip as he fumbles through his prayer? Is he numb? Is he hyper aware of each heartbeat as it brings him closer to death? Take this cup from me. Not my will be yours. How do we reconcile that? Is it God's will for God's son to die? A lot of people see this paradox encompassing the flesh and obedience to divine will. But if that's the case, then we have to equate Jesus with the non-offending caregiver, the complicit caregiver. Right? Um, this God willing to participate in acts of domestic violence and torture goes against the God that Jesus teaches about. What is God's will then? Uh, in his ministry, Jesus teaches about a God of love. Perhaps he's really saying, please, God, don't let this happen. But if it does, then let love come from it. But during this anguished prayer, he seeks safety, and he returns to his disciples again and again to find them sleeping. He's praying in agony, and your stones throw away. And despite this, his friends aren't present. He expressed his need, asking them to simply keep watch, and they didn't. He agonized in the garden, knowing his torture and death were near, and his friends slept. He could not secure help or even comforting presence in this moment. His friends make it impossible. How does this isolation express itself within the body? Are the deep, sleepy breaths of his disciples deafening in the silence? Does the isolation push in from every direction as his feet carry him forward? Does he fling his arms in frustration as he wakes them for a third time? This anguished prayer and failure of the disciples is all too familiar for people who have experienced child sexual abuse. Many have endured their own garden of Gethsemane, distraught and overwhelmed with sorrow. They sat up late at night, begging God to intervene. And as the incarnation of God, Jesus had divine knowledge and understanding. But what about the child? What about the child that believes in a powerful, mythic, and literal God? How do you disentangle all those confusing strands, the sleepy carelessness of the parents, uh, the, the lack of literal godly intervention, um, a sense of self that's created by how they believe others, including God, see them? Parents are supposed to love the most painful moments of life. God is supposed to intervene. The cup, however, is not taken. The abuse continues, and those meant to keep watch over the child's sleep. I expand more in my dissertation on Peter and the arrest. In the interest of time, I want to jump to our next section, the death of innocence. In this next death on the road to deicide, Jesus encounters the death of innocence. And if you're unfamiliar with this argument, then it might seem shocking and even a little offensive. Okay? But hang with me for a minute. Okay? Jesus was sexually abused. He was publicly stripped three times, and we usually skate right over it. So let's look at the actual text. Okay? The governor's soldiers take Jesus into the praetorium. They gather the whole company of soldiers around him. They strip him, the first stripping, and put a scarlet robe on him. They twist together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They kneel in front of him and mock him, hell king of the Jews. They spit on him. They take his staff and strike him. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. So he stripped for a second time. Okay. Then they lead him away to crucify him. And as they're going out, they meet a man named Simon. They force him to carry the cross. They come to Golgotha. They offer Jesus wine to drink. But after tasting it, he refuses. When they crucify him, they divide up his clothes. He stripped a third time. And they cast lots. Now, this public stripping of Jesus, we don't usually sit with it. Typically, we talk about the beating, the mocking, the crucifixion, but we tend to gloss over the public stripping. But if we were to take someone in the street today in modern society and publicly strip and humiliate them three times, 
There's no question we would call that sexual abuse. This public stripping of Jesus was intended to invoke feelings of fear, vulnerability, and shame. It was an attempt to emasculate, humiliate, and degrade. And contextually speaking, the Romans were very skilled at using sexual abuse and sexual humiliation and crucifixion. So the expectation, the threat of sexual violence is also there. Okay? But we're uncomfortable sitting with it, even to the point that our artistic representations depict Jesus in a loincloth because it's too shocking for us to sit with. Okay? So Jesus is commonly associated with elements of purity, holiness, goodness, chastity, uh, but he's also human. And in this passion, he suffered some of the worst abuses of human power. But what did his body endure in those moments? As the blows rain down on him and insults are hurled in every direction, does he stay present? Does he feel every strike and every bead of blood as it carved a path down his body? Does he try to hide his nakedness from onlookers, from family and friends? Could he feel his wounds throbbing under the sun as he stumbled toward Golgotha? Or did he dissociate? Did he simply endure, placing one foot in front of the other, marching toward his death? This chaste innocence and purity associated with God incarnate is wounded in this moment. His nakedness and vulnerability are largely met by a taunting crowd that does not see him as pure, innocent, or godly. They don't see him as made in God's image. Does this dehumanization leave him feeling broken, dirty, or less than, ashamed? Victims of CSAI report those feelings. So maybe they can find a companion here in Jesus. For those that have endured incest, this death of innocence occurs in the violation of the body. The body itself is no longer a safe space. Shame seeps into the tissues and hijacks one's identity. Impurity becomes the substance of being, reminding again and again that this experience has rendered a child dirty and discarded. This death of innocence has occurred. And as the body is opened up to be pillaged at will, the child learns that in order to keep moving forward, they must endure. In order to endure, they must dissociate. Survival comes at the cost of disembodiment. Finally, the body of Jesus literally dies. And in my work, I go through each of the last lines of Jesus, but I'm going to condense here again. Okay. His body is crucified and broken, and that's made worse by the Jewish belief that anyone that's hung on a tree was under a curse. So his last words in both Matthew and Mark are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The compounded harm that he's endured up until this point spills over into this anguished prayer. Pierced by nails, the weight of his own body rips his flesh. And as the sun beats down on him and the crowd taunts him during his hour of greatest pain, he cries out the opening words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The succeeding verses of the psalm outline the uh, Israelite attack from enemies and the hope in victory of God. But those lines don't escape the lips of Jesus. Why? In his suffering, is he connecting to his ancestors, to the Israelites during their demise? Perhaps his one line says it all. Perhaps his voice is too weak and the pain too great for him to continue. And as this lament escapes his lips on the precipice of death, maybe he's just reaching for God in his agony. As the child bears their cross, the cry for God echoes feelings of desperation and confusion. When caregivers abandon their sacred duty of love and protection, when the child is assaulted and dehumanized, when their identity is made and God's image is crucified, where is God? The weight of cumulative wounds rip the flesh like nails. Social criticism and fear beat down upon one's truth like the blistering sun at Golgotha. Culture attempts to hurl insults and discredit pain. And yet even in this anguish, there's a cry for God. Unspoken in this torment are the remaining verses of Psalm 22, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. Later, Jesus will say, I am thirsty. And it's easy to imagine his dry lips streaked with blood, his voice weak as his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. As his body gives its last breath, he says, it is finished. It's relieved. As he dies on the cross, the sky is darkened, the veil is torn, and a Roman soldier understands that he is the son of God. 
This death of Jesus is, in no uncertain term, the asylum. The people don't understand. This death challenges what they thought they knew about Jesus. It violates the Jewish understanding of what a Messiah should be. Jesus does not conquer like King David. He does not establish the nation of Israel. He does not overthrow Rome. The death of his body kills the expectations the people had of him as Messiah. As his lifeless body hangs on the cross, traditional ways of knowing God, traditional expectations are destroyed. The same is true when one endures CSAI. The expectations that one has of God are shattered as the body endures sexual violation. God does not intervene to save Jesus from the cross no more than God did when the sexually abused child cried out in the night, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This points to the painful realization that death has occurred in more ways than one. Safety, innocence, and God are killed. How can a child go on? God did not conquer the abuser. God did not establish a new space for the child to thrive. God did not overthrow the culture that allowed for such abuse. The way one knows God has died. And although burial is the next step and Holy Saturday is the way forward, we can't move on too quickly from this finality of death. This deicide is not a flippant idea. It's not just a psychological distortion. It's earth shattering and paradigm shifting. The irrevocability of what has occurred lacerates the veil in the holiest of spaces, signaling a shift between what is and what is to come. The remaining two chapters of my work are still being written, and they will look deeply at Holy Saturday and Resurrection Sunday. In Holy Saturday, Jesus is dead, and no one has any reason to think that this death is not final. We know it's not because we know the way the story ends. But at the time, death was final. And to be honest, we don't really know what happens in Holy Saturday. But we know that we have to remain in this liminal space for a while. We have to learn to be comfortable in this mystery between death and life. It's in this space of Holy Saturday that survivors can ask the hard questions. Why me? Why did God allow this? Where was God in this? Where is God now? How do we make sense of this? It's in this space they have to learn to move forward by feeling their way through the dark, by learning how to remain in a body marked by violation. And when we get to Resurrection Sunday, we experience hope, defeat of death, and a new way of being. In this chapter, I plan to bring uh, social scientific methods of healing into dialogue with the resurrection narrative. So the body is resurrected, but it has wounds, right? The wounds of the crucifixion remain. So how can we heal the body and still learn to live with those wounds? Yoga, mindfulness, other methods of healing can be used to do that. Okay. Jesus is a different person after this resurrection. The way we think about Jesus changes. If he did not get resurrected, then he's just another dude that got crucified by Rome. But because of the resurrection, the memory of it changes. The story is altered. It gets a new identity. So how can that change the narrative? Um, EMDR, counseling, Ignatian spiritual practices, which invite God into memory and prayer, can be utilized in this space. And finally, the body of Christ, the Great Commission. Jesus commissions his disciples to go out and heal the world, to share the good news that death is not the end. It's not the totality of who we are. The burden of healing cannot be placed on the survivor alone. We have a responsibility to meet this reality in functional ways that actually change our society. Okay? It's the responsibility of the community, of all of us. It's the responsibility of the church to help heal. Practically, the church can do so much more because to be quite honest, they're failing radically right now. We're starting to talk about sexual abuse, but we are not talking about the one in four women in the pews. We're not talking about how to heal that. We're not embodying our theology. So there are ways, practical ways, that that can be changed through trauma-informed liturgy, through small groups, through Bible studies that read the Bible from a hermeneutic of trauma. Okay? 
um, through supporting survivor leaders in the church, okay? To even talking about the body, you know, not even from a trauma perspective, but honoring and embodying theology in the way we talk about life beyond don't do this with your body, don't do that. Okay. So ultimately, this is a work of hope. Okay. I know I gave you a lot of heavy stuff because that's what I've written so far, but <laughs> the last two chapters, um, the goal is to help process that and bring that to a practical way that we can start to help heal this wound that is endemic in our society. So thank you so much for being part of this conversation. I hope to get some great feedback. I'd like to take a minute to open it up for discussion if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I, I gave you a lot this morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of your method, I know you said it's something about social science methods in the last two chapters, but did you also do interviews along the way? I don't know if the people online can hear, but yeah. So she she asked about my methods and interviews. Um, so I use previously published narratives um, because getting our approval for this type of research is fun. <laughs> so um, a lot of what I've included are composite narratives that are already published, um, often anonymously, that I'm incorporating. And then I'm using um, David Tracy's analogical imagination, his methods of analogical imagination kind of framework, which I know as a social science person doesn't mean much to you, right? <laughs> um, it's uh, drawing on analogy and metaphor. Yeah. Just a quick question. In relationship with the author of those ideas, when we go into research, when you get your biblical metaphor and you're diving in, what was, what's like your, been your biggest surprise or your biggest aha moment with that biblical metaphor? I have to stop and think about that one for a minute. Um, so many things, honestly. So he asked, what, what's my biggest um, aha moment in using this, the metaphor, the passion narrative? Um, you know, it was a several years ago when I first ran across David Toombs' argument that Jesus had been sexually abused. Um, and he published it like in the 90s, but it just didn't gain any traction until the Me Too movement kind of exploded. Um, and then it rose to the surface again. I think um, diving into the idea of Jesus as sexually abused really helped me change the way I think about that, the cross narrative. Um, I had, you know, prior to this PhD, never really considered that before. Um, but also the, the peripheral deaths that occur outside of the bodily death, I think starts to chip away at a sense of safety, a sense of self. And so just really thinking deeply about the humanizing experience of that uh, from a Christological perspective, just, it, I had to sit with it for a while. I really had to sit with, um, you know, what did Jesus experience? Because so often I think we have such a high Christology, we think of Jesus as, yeah, yeah, he was human, but he's still Jesus, right? But to really humanize some of these experiences and think about what his body endured, um, it was it was a big shift for me. Can I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. How do you shift this from those those? How do you shift this from a practical sense of someone who's experienced child sexual assault and has perhaps fallen away from religion? How do you pull this narrative and make it relevant to them? If many of the stages that they're, you're walking them through from a, from a research standpoint, how do you how do you pull those together? Does that make sense? Yeah. So let me repeat it to make sure that I got you. So how do I make this relevant for somebody that has kind of fallen away from religion as a result of these experiences? Yeah, maybe in, in your own language and has really experienced the the assignment and just cut themselves off. So sure. what does that look like? Um yeah, I think that, you know, this metaphor isn't going to work for everybody. Uh, I think sometimes wounds are deep, and, and I presented this in kind of a linear fashion, but healing is not linear, right? We're going to circle back and spiral back into it. 
And so in the midst of EMDR and yoga, right, you still circle back to those questions of why did God let this happen, right? Um, and for some people, it may be, you know, a hard slide into atheism because I can't believe in God that, that would do this, right? I think in Holy Saturday, a lot of those questions um, come up. And, and often people will be in a Holy Saturday moment and not even realize it, right? Because it's not like, you know, one day I'm going to sit and think about why God let this happen and I'm going to solve the problem of suffering in the world. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Um, so I think that um, we stew in that for a while. I think that as hard as it is, the magic happens in that liminal space. Uh, it's that space of, of darkness, of turning away from it a lot of times that so much transformation occurs usually when we don't even realize it. Is that? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a state of the panic that uh, arose. And one of the phrases that was used was the name of children. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of interesting because I've been seeing podcasts about it. Kind of person yeah. um, to, to hear your work, right? Where we're talking about how children are silenced, mm -hmm. and then simultaneously there's like an emergent narrative that is that persists that we're supposed to be difficult because the children aren't able to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, how does that how does that fit into this kind of child sex world? Try to TSA. I that's chapter one. Okay, um, <laughs> let me read it. Yeah. So um, for the people online, she was asking. Um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there was the satanic panic where we talked a lot about believe the children, but simultaneously children were silenced. How do we reconcile those things? Um, so the silence, um, it's really disturbing. You know, speaking of things, Rob, that were hard for me to swallow. Uh, when I started to learn the context and the history of our child sexual abuse laws, oh gosh, it just makes your skin crawl, right? Like it, it was not until pretty recently that we said, you know, an age of consent at like you know, 16 or whatever, right? I mean, historically speaking, up until the 19th century, if a child or a woman was raped, we sought justice by financial restitution to her father or husband. So she's an object, right? And like, there's all, I mean, and it's about, like we're just gonna pay the family off and not worry about this, right? And it's really disturbing. Um, so the systems of silence, um, are, have deep historical roots. Um, and I think we break those by spaces like this, right? Um, not just listening to my research project, but then realizing that one in four of your students, one in four of your female students that we sit with in class every single day, and one in eight men, probably more, because men are even more underreported than women, right? Have been sexually abused and they're carrying that around oftentimes in silence having never been yeah um, are there any uh religious scholars out there who give talks or publish uh excerpts or whatever who have been through there that serve as an inspiration for these people yes um monica coleman is she wrote the Dina Project, um, and it is basically a handbook for how churches can engage more trauma-informed. And she's a survivor of sexual assault. Um, Chanel Smith, she's a womanist theologian. Um, she writes about it. Um, there are several others. Susan Shooter, How Survivors of Abuse Relate to God. Jane Grobajan, Theology as an Eruption into Embodiment. A lot of the leadership coming out from survivor leaders. Are they uh, any people who need for therapy or whatever? Do they give those resources to the people and say these people have overcome? Well, one of the things that I'm pushing in on chapter seven in particular is that um, our clergy are not typically trained to handle this, right? This is often presented as maybe a week in an elected class. Right. Um, so the when I say the church is failing, one of the ways that we're failing is by training our clergy. They're not trained to handle this. Right. 
Um, and so they don't have the resources to put in people's hands because they're not familiar with it. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping to be able to change and make some headway on is, you know, hey, if, if it's this predominant in our population, like you need to be more equipped to deal with it. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about um, the, the issues of prevalence that you were talking about, of, of especially in children, the rates of sexual abuse among young children and how oftentimes they're reporting or they're, they're dealing with that are, are so suppressed over time. And, you know, a lot of the, the methods that she listed on the screen a moment ago dealt with working with adults, it seemed like, or, or older children. What do you think are some of the implications for uh, another safe space, schools, for example, for working with children that, you know, they may, whether they report that or whether it's discovered that they've undergone that kind of trauma, what kind of implications do you see for, for school settings? So um, she asked, what, what are the implications for dealing with children, um, like children that are sexually abused before they get to the adult stage, like in school systems. Um, so Dan Allender points out, and all the literature backs it up, that um, the amount of harm incurred by child sexual abuse is directly proportional to the parent-child relationship. So if you sexually abuse as a child and you have a healthy parent-child relationship, and you can go to a parent and say, hey, this happened, and appropriate interventions and support take place, you know, it sucks, but like you can land on your feet, right? But if you're sexually abused and there is not a healthy safe space within the home, if there's not, you know, a parent that you can tell or appropriate interventions don't take place, if you don't have a parent to turn to or a guardian to turn to, then the harm is all that much worse, right? So the harm incurred is in direct proportion to the parent-child relationship. Um, so that means that um, we need to really start to look at our systems that we have in place. Um, intervention systems, uh, counseling in schools, foster care systems, um, you know. So I was at a yoga retreat a couple weekends ago and one of the women that are in the retreat with us um, was a social worker and she left the system, she worked in the foster care system. And one of the reasons that she left, she's in West Virginia, one of the reasons she left is because um, she felt like she was perpetuating harm, that she loved what she did, she loved the children. But in the system, the foster parents were the client, not the child, uh, and had become monetized. And so, you know, the ideal goal is to keep the child in the home if they have to be removed, right? Because we know that it causes less detrimental impact if the child can stay with family, right? But if grandma has a drug charge from the 70s and she's been totally clean since then, the West Virginia system wouldn't allow you to place a child with grandma. Right? And so we just perpetuate that kind of harm. Um, so I think your question points us to really start to analyze our systems and think about what are we doing here? You know? And what are ways that we can support parents, right? Because um, you know, the other side of this is that we have, you know, a child is sexually abused by dad in the home, or well, mom may also be a victim of domestic violence, afraid to say anything, or she'll get beat up or shot, right? So she's also a victim. I mean, she's also complicit, but also a victim. How do we deal with that dynamic? How do we support people in situations like that? Makes me wonder, you know, in my field, we talk about levels of analysis. And I thought when you, toward the end of your presentation, it was about the individual level in counseling and healing and, and you know, groups. And your answer there just suggested that it's system level. It's all of it. <laughs> and that was my question, you know, as you, as someone comes along and reads your dissertation, Will they have a sense that they've been dealing on different levels and the implications for your research are for policymakers, therapists, clergy, yeah, the United Nations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it is the systems are layered. Um, and I say at the outset of my work that I'm writing this for adult female survivors and those who journey with them, right? Um, so on the one hand, it's very individual, right? And I'm writing a lot to the Christian community to really rethink um, how, how we engage the biblical text. 
and untapped potential of the biblical text, right? That, that yes, I mean, we're in the Lent, Lenten season right now. There's so much, you know, reflection happening. And we're going to go to Easter, the Easter service and hear, you know, the same message we've heard every single Easter, right? I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> so, but there's more potential in the story, right? Um, so on the one hand, yes, it's very individual, but it's also systemic. It's also the church. It's also, you know, anybody who wants to journey with. And part of the challenge of that is there's a lot right, that can't fit into this dissertation. So when I get to the last chapter, one of the things that I want to point out kind of the further research is here's the things the community can do. Here's the areas that need further work that I can't fit into the scope of this, but I want to point out to say we need to be thinking about this. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Anybody online have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up then. I just want to take a second and thank everybody that's here in the room and online, especially my chair who's on the Zoom call, Dr. Mary Carter Warren. Um, <laughs> thanks Mary for being here. Um, I am so proud of you and so proud of the work that you're doing. And I hope you Pike is super proud to have you there as part of the, their community. Thank you so much. And Mother Keela, I see Mother Keela on the call too. Thanks, thanks Mother for being here. Um, I really appreciate you guys. I know I went over on time, but I appreciate you joining this conversation. And I, hopefully I gave you something to think about um, as we move forward. Thank you. Bye, guys. I'm going to end the call now. Great job. Thank you. <laughs>